Philippians chapter number four, we're going to break off six, six and seven and work through that content this morning, but I want to back it up and read verse number one all the way down through seven. So we've covered through verse five already, but I'll remind you a little bit of what we've covered. So Philippians four, verse number one, Paul comes to the end of this letter and he says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He oozes with affection here. This verse is extremely soft and tender and gentle and just, I love you and you're my joy and you're my crown and you're my beloved. But right towards the end of the verse, there's this command that is less than soft and gentle. There's a command that's firm, it's resolute, and it's so stand fast in the Lord. It's I want you to, to be spiritually stable. I want you to be resolute in your spiritual walk. Stand fast in the Lord. But he says the word so, which is such a key to the whole passage. So means in this way or in this manner. So how would I be spiritually stable? Paul's going to tell you. He's going to tell you marks of a spiritually stable person through the first nine verses. So we gave you Mark 1 a couple weeks ago, and that was relational harmony in the Lord. So he says in verse number 2, I beseech Yodius and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Who, these are two ladies that weren't getting along. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. So here's a third party, a guy. Come alongside, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So we talked about how a mark of spiritual stability is relational harmony, getting along with people. That, that's very Christian, to get along with people, not to be divisive. And we said that your unity comes through humility, and humility comes through unity. Unity with other people comes through humility. Humility comes through unity with Christ. So I want you to be of the same mind in the Lord. Then he gives them a second mark. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That was last week. This, this spirit of joy that possesses us because we know who the Lord is, and it's attached to in the Lord, rejoicing always. Then he gave us a third mark. He said, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your moderation be known means do not have vengeful, retaliatory behavior. You should, you should walk through this life with peace, and you can do that because you know the Lord is present. You know Jesus is there. You know he's beside you. New content, new mark. Verse number six, be careful for nothing. You could also say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This instruction, I think we can boil down to this. Turn your cares into prayers. Paul, Paul is saying someone who's spiritually stable is someone who's gonna be really good at turning their cares into into prayers. And that is what I want to talk to you about this morning. I think if there was ever a couple of verses that are needed for Americans, perhaps it is verses six and seven of Philippians chapter number four. I was reminded of the potency of this verse and how needed it is just this last week. I, about two weeks ago, I woke up on a Tuesday and I couldn't hear out of my right ear about 60 or 70 percent just overnight. It was weird. And uh, I went to the doctor, tried to figure it out, and then went to uh, even a specialist last week. And I got it all figured out, and everything's great, and everything's honky-dory, and, and no worries there. But I, I was, last week, I was literally preaching through our sermon on rejoicing in the Lord, and I can't hear hardly anything. And I'm in my own head, and I'm thinking, like, all week long, like, God's putting me to the test. Like, he's going to take away the hearing out of my ear and make sure that I meant what I said. Like, I have to rejoice in him despite this. And uh, thank the Lord it was not that way. And I'm hearing great this morning. But I started my journey on getting that fixed with my primary care physician just about 10 days ago. And my primary care physician started to ask me, you know, little questions. What's going on? This, this, and this. Are you taking any medications? No, I'm not. Just multivitamin, da, da, da. But then he asked me this question. He said, are you still taking Zantac? And I thought in my mind, if you don't know what Zantac is, it's over-the-counter medication for heartburn, but it can also be used as like an antiacid or things like that. I had completely forgot that roughly a year or so ago, for about two months, I was taking Zantac because I was so stressed and so pent up and so anxious that it had gotten to a point to where there was so much acid in my stomach that I, I couldn't take it any longer. 
And, and me, when I get stressed, my left eye twitches first, then my chest gets tight and I have, you know, feels like I can breathe fire like I'm a dragon, you know what I'm talking about. And then if it gets really bad, the acid starts to build up in my stomach. And I was, I was literally a year ago, and I forgot all about it, but he said that and I thought, we need this, I need this. Like I need this instruction from Philippians chapter four to tell me to be anxious for nothing and how, how in the world could I ever get there? How could I get to a place to where I'm not stressed and anxious and worried about things going on in my life? And lucky for you, God tells you. And it's right here in Philippians chapter number four and he starts with verse six, four simple words, but he gives us just this problem of anxiety. He says, be careful for nothing. Being careful for nothing does not mean be uncaring or be careless. It means that we should be without anxiety in all details and all circumstances of life. Now, anxiety was just the way of life for the ancient world for different reasons than our modern world, but it was a way of life that most people went through life fearing the gods or the goddesses who would be mad at them and did I do enough to appease them and there was this constant consternation that I'm gonna turn the corner and a lightning bolt's gonna be thrown at me or God's gonna you know, be vengeful or get, get after me because I didn't appease the gods in the right way. Now, we as modern Americans, I, I very rarely would meet someone who's, whose mind is subjugated to this thought that there's some sort of primitive deities that are out to get their pound of flesh. Most people don't think that way any longer, thankfully. But we do still have a problem that's rooted in other things, but we have a problem of anxiety nonetheless. And our minds are riddled with these thoughts of how am I going to handle that and what am I going to do and what are they going to think and, and I don't know if I can make that happen and what if I fail and, and why can't I just know what's happening here and, and I think that they may fill in the blank. Our minds are riddled with these thoughts and day by day by day we get spun up by anxiety. And what happens when you get spun up is that eventually you get broken down. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic said this. He said, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. It profoundly affects the health. And worry and stress lead to distress or die stress. Die meaning two or double. It leads to double stress. And then we get high blood pressure and ulcers and indigestion and chest pains and headaches and mood swings and forgetfulness and irritability and all that comes with our anxiety and our worry. Surveys tell us that 89% of Americans suffer from time to time with what is called chronic stress syndrome. That's nine out of 10, that's a lot. 75% of Americans say that they have great stress one day a week. I think Corrie ten Boom said it well, and she knew the destructive force of worry and anxiety when she said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. And many people, even many Christian people, muddle through life emotionally drained, physically fatigued, spiritually defeated, because they're worried and concerned and anxious about all that is happening on their horizon. I think Warren Wearsby said it well. He said, most Christians are crucified on a cross between two thieves, yesterday's regret and tomorrow's worries. And between our regret and our worries, we kill ourselves. And here, the Lord actually gives us some instruction. He says, don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't, don't be pent up about this. Don't be stressed about this. And the problem with anxiety, it's, it's not just a physical, it ultimately manifests itself in the spiritual because our anxiety begins to make us do foolish, self-destructive, sinful things. We become anxious about our finances, so what do we do? We overcommit at work and we prioritize money over God and over our family. We become anxious about our grades, so what do we do? We cheat. We set aside our integrity and we choose to cheat our way into a good grade because I'm worried that I won't get a good enough grade. We become anxious about commitments and we make too many of them and now we can't keep our word because we've committed to too much stuff. We become anxious about the side effects of anxiety and the acid builds even more. We get anxious about being anxious. We get anxious about our schedule and all that's happening, the demands and work and stress, and all of a sudden we're short with people and we're rude with people and we argue over little things and things blow up that shouldn't have blown up. And we find ourselves saying, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just a stressful time right now. 
We find ourselves saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going through a lot right now. What we're attesting to is that I don't normally act this way, and I know I should not act this way, but my anxiety and my stress is making me act this way, and I don't want to. And all too often, we find ourselves in that boat. And beyond that, we're very vulnerable to the attacks of the devil when we're anxious and worried. Deuteronomy 25 is one of my favorite passages. It's a window into this where it talks about King Amalek and his strategy on trying to defeat the children of Israel. And Deuteronomy 25 tells us that Amalek did this when they came out of Egypt. He met them by the way and he smote the hindmost of these. He even all that were feeble and behind thee when thou wast faint and weary. That his strategy was to take the people on the outskirts, on the perimeter, those that were lagging behind, those that were faint and weary, and he wanted to pick them off because they were easy targets, because they were worn down. And in a very similar way, in your spiritual life, when you become anxious and worried and broken down by that, you become easy prey for the devil to get after you and to begin to wreak havoc in your life. So anxiety and worry is a problem for us. And perhaps you're here this morning and you think, you know what, I've been the last month and it's just been worry-free and things have been great and grand. No anxiety on my part. Great, give us a seminar on how you do that after we're all said and done. But most of us this morning can relate. We can get the problem of anxiety. But I want you to notice a contrast that is, that is utterly different in verse number seven. And here is not a problem, here's some provision. Here's something from the hand of the Lord that's available. Verse 7, And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So here's a promise of peace. So if you ever engage in imaginary what-if thinking, if you ever take scenarios and blow them up in your mind and start to jump to conclusions before you're there, If you ever look at a a dilemma and you start to imagine the worst case scenario and how this would play out, if you start to have that conversation in your head, this is going to be a confrontation with someone. So I'm going to tell them and then they're going to get mad at me and then they're going to shoot arrows at me and then I'm going to breathe fire at them and then they're going to pull out their billy bat and I'm going to pull out my knives and then my family's going to jump in and then, you know, we're Hatfields and McCoys. We do that stuff, right? We begin to think in these negative draining patterns of imagining what could happen, and we begin to be anxious and worry about it. And you have to know that God's plan for you is not turmoil, it's peace. His plan for you isn't designed to be stress, it's designed to be rest. He wants you to have peace. I came across in in my study this story from this book, The Cities and Bishoprics of Phrygia. And perhaps that's on your nightstand and you read it this week, but I'm doubtful. But it was interesting to me, they found this inscription, and Phrygia was, was an area where Paul went often, it was modern day Turkey, it was around Galatia, and he went there often, and there were churches that, that were started, and Christian people, and they found this, this inscription to this man named Titidios Amarimnas. And they, in studying this and looking at it and all of it, they believe, they can't say for certain, but they believe that Titidios was his given name, and Amarimnas was his baptismal name, it was his Christian name. It wasn't unusual in in the early centuries for you to get baptized and to receive a Christian name. And marimnos means worry. A or A is a negator. So they put that on the the beginning and they gave him the Christian name, No Worries. Like they named the guy Akuna Matata. Like that's what they named him. (laughs) I thought, how awesome is that? Like this guy gets saved and they say, you're a Christian now, Akuna Matata, brother. Like no worries, that's your name. I thought that should be indicative. That should be a testimony. That should be us as believers. That's a mark of spiritual stability that Paul is wanting to get after here. That should be us. And he says, this is a peace of God. And let me talk about the peace of God. It surpasses all understanding. Like this transcends our human reasoning. It's something that's there. It's tangible. It's, we- it's, it's real. It's not a theory. It's not a concept. It's not ethereal. It's real. It, it works itself out dynamically in our life day to day, but we don't even understand it all. We, we can't even fully explain exactly how it happens. It surpasses our human understanding. If you've ever been in a situation where you should be worried and you should be concerned and you should be, you know, chomping your nails off, but you're not, and you're thinking to yourself, why am I not worried about this? 
Why, why is this not gripping me the way that it grips other people? Well, the reason that's happening is because the peace of God is there. And it's doing something for you that, that you can't even explain or do it for yourself. And it says this passes all understanding. And then he says this. He said, the peace of God passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That word keep your hearts and minds is the idea of a legion of Roman soldiers standing guard and protecting. I don't know if it went down this way, but I could picture Paul riding under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but in his cell writing and the peace of God, oh, it passes all understanding. And it's like he's in his prison cell, chained to a guard. It's like, it's like Bob over here who's just guarding me, who won't let people come in and out. It's, it's a guard. It's a protector. It's someone standing there over you, over your heart and over your mind. Let me put it in modern terms. The peace of God is like a bouncer at the door of your heart. With his little list, people walk up, situations walk up, What's your name? Worry, anxiety. Oh, not on the list. Out you go. That the peace of God is there to guard and protect and keep you from the things that would naturally plague you. And Paul says, there is this peace that I want you to have. And I read that and I think, uh, I want that. Like, sign me up. I, I, will, I will gladly take verse 7. Like, please, give that to me. Give that to my heart. Give that to my mind. The peace of God. Well, how do we get that? Well, there's an arrangement here. Back to verse number six. This is an if-then sort of thing. Verse six, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. So there's a promise in verse seven, but there's an arrangement that you have to follow. This is, if you will, then you will get. There, there's something that is within our control a bit. That if I will do verse 6, then verse 7 can be mine. So what does it say? It says in everything. All things, big, little, doesn't matter. Dark days, light days, doesn't matter. In everything, by prayer. Talking to God, supplication, a type of prayer. Making our requests known. Giving him, Lord, here's my concerns. Here's my worries. I need your help. It's a petition, a supplication. Lord, would you help me? I invite you. I want you. I'm, I'm asking for your help. Worry doesn't accomplish anything, but prayer actually does. It's actually effectual. It works. It does something. If you would make them known and make them known with thanksgiving. And I'm glad that Paul, that Paul put that there. Because... Our natural tendency when worry and anxiety get the best of us is to forget everything that we have to be thankful for. To become myopic and focus just on what is in front of us and what is bad in our life. But Paul says, remind yourself of the things that you should be thankful for as you're doing this process. And, and thanksgiving should be natural. That's the basic position of a believer as we petition God. We humbly, gratefully come to him and say, Lord, I mean, we just sang about it all this morning. Lord, thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy and what you've given to me. I'm, gr I'm glad. I'm grateful. I want to give my cares to you, but I'm thankful for this. So Paul's saying, look, don't worry about your future. Take your concerns. Give them to God, and God will give you peace. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. Scripture is replete with different verses that tell us just this. Isaiah tells us that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Peter tells us that we should cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. Take all your care and all your worries and just roll them over to Jesus. And here's how this works. Let's say you have a stress factor that enters into your life. Let's say you go to the doctor, annual checkup, the doctor finds a lump and you sit down in the doctor's office and they say, you know what? We found a lump, we don't know what it is. We need to do a biopsy, we need to investigate a little further. Okay, you walk out of the doctor's office with a cup of anxiety now. You were just gifted a cup of anxiety, and you can do one of two things. You can take that and pour it into the vat of worry and concern and anxiety, and you can turn on the fire and pull out your spoon and begin to stir it up and stew on it and brood on it and just, and just think about that and, and think about all the worst possible outcomes and what they're going to say and what that biopsy is going to be and what type of cancer. You can just concern and worry and anxiety. And before long, you'll have a wonderful little bubbling pot of pessimism that you can drink from for the rest of your life if you want to. 
And frankly, some of you have been. And on behalf of your family and your friends and those that are close to you, I'm here to tell you, please stop. The alternative is you take your cup of anxiety and you pour it into the pot of prayer. And you say, Lord, I receive your lordship. I understand that this lump didn't get there by accident. I understand it didn't slip by you today, that this wasn't, you're not in heaven, you know, wringing your hands, what am I gonna do with this biopsy? You're in charge, you're in control, I know that. Lord, I, I, this worries me. This, this concerns me. God, I'm, I'm fearful. I'm starting to think about what's life gonna be like if I don't see my grandkid get married. What's life gonna be like if this happens? If, Lord, I'm concerned about this, so I'm giving it over to you. I'm trusting in your sovereignty. I surrender it to you, and while I'm at it, Lord, I thank you. God, thank you for the 10,000 days I haven't worried about cancer. God, thank you for the tax refund this year. Thank you for the advice I got from the, the fellow church member at church last week. Lord, while I'm giving you my concerns, I thank you and I turn it over. Those are your options. And Paul says, take, take plan B. Take prayer. Take your anxiety and take your worry and take your woes and pour them out to God. Express them to God. As I prepped for the sermon, I came across this exercise that is very simple, but I had never thought of. And it, it was an exercise that was encouraging people to mind dump all of their prayers and all of their anxiety onto paper. So I did this this weekend. I pulled out a sheet of paper and I made categories for my life. Dad, husband, pastor, Christian, family member, you know, to my, to my parents and my siblings, uh, a boss even, you know, I put out all these and I just started to list under these, under these headings all of my anxieties and all, anything I could think of, anything that was in my heart. I just began to put, just write it down on paper and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote some more and I wrote some more and I wrote some more and it was just there and there and there and I was, I was amazed first of all what came out of me. As I began to, Lord, Lord, show me what's there. Lord, Lord, show me my heart. Put it there. And there were things that you would naturally think. There were things that I was surprised that I was even concerned about. I was concerned, and I realized I was expending mental energy, draining myself on what will happen when my four-year-old son becomes a teenager in the context of our sex-crave culture. I was worried that my four-year-old will grow up and be a teenager and his friends will introduce him to pornography and he'll become a little pervert and he'll become just someone who, who wants to, you know, chase girls all the time. That was in my heart. Now, certainly I want to be vigilant and I think that there's some things as a dad I can do to be proactive along the way, but I'm worrying about something 10 years from now. Now, that, that's real life. That's me. I don't know what your worries are, but those are there. And one by one, I took those and said, God, I can do a little bit of something about this, so give me your strength and give me your power and give me your help. But Lord, I turn that one over to you. And Lord, that one, I can't even control that. That's completely outside of my control. But I'm worried about it. So Lord, I give it to you and I ask, I ask for your help. And I know that you're big and strong. And one by one by one. And by the time I was done with that exercise, you know what happened? There was a peace inside of my heart that I had just given all of my cares to Jesus. That I just turned over all of all of my anxiety and all of my woe. And was it there the next day to be turned over again? Yeah, it was. But there was a peace that was there because I rolled it upon him. And this is what Paul is saying. Take your care. Take your worry. Take your anxiety. And don't suppress it and bottle it up inside. Push it out and up to Jesus. Give it to him and put it in his hands and say, Lord, I trust you for this. But lastly, I would say there's this, and this is similar to last week. There is inside of verse six, this phrase, unto God. There is this phrase at the end of verse seven, through Christ Jesus. And all of this is only made possible if you understand who God and who Jesus are. Because you have to understand, I am giving this not just to somebody, but I'm giving this to the only person who can really do something about this. But I have a God who is strong and able and capable and powerful, and I'm gonna give this to him. Now our culture worships autonomy. Our culture worships self-sufficiency. The I did it, my good, my power, my smarts, my education, my planning, my diligence, da 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 This 
is saying you aren't sufficient in and of yourself. And there's a recognition of that. There's a, there's a humility here, that understanding that I can't do this myself, so God, I'm giving it to you. I need your help. I'm turning it over to you. And you can do this. You can, you can complain to your friends, and you can vent to your spouse, and you can talk to your therapist, but if you don't push it to God, you are negating the one person that can actually do something about it. I'm not saying that there's not some sort of therapeutic value in talking to other people and sharing your woes and, and, and talking to other people, but if you do that but never give it to God, then, then you're, you're never really going to get anywhere. This is meant to be given to God, and I love you enough to shoot straight with you. This, this makes sense. It would make sense that if we have a big, strong, sovereign God, that we would trust Him. And when we're anxious and worried what we're really communicating to the world around us is my God is untrustworthy. That's a punch to the gut, but that's the truth. When we're concerned and fretting and worried about everything, all we're communicating is that God isn't big enough to handle this and I'm not trusting him. That worry, it's been said, is the toxic waste of unbelief. This is why Jesus could say exactly this in Matthew 6. His Sermon on the Mount, he talks for about 10, 12 verses specifically on anxiety. And he says, don't worry about life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, don't worry about it. Think about this. You have a big God. Think about the birds. The birds, are they, are they starving? They get fed? How do they get fed? They go to McDonald's? I don't think so. Maybe some little ghetto pigeons are at McDonald's sometimes, but that's from God. God fed them. Think about the lilies. They're beautiful. Look at how they're clothed. Solomon, in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor, in all of his riches, in all of his kingly apparel, he didn't look like they did. Who did that? God did. So Jesus ends that instruction, and he tells them, you know what the problem is? O ye of little faith. He connects our worry to our lack of faith. And he says the real problem and the real root here is that you don't have a big enough, strong enough God that you're willing to turn it all over to. So he tells them, don't worry. It, it'll happen. God, God will take care of you. So what's the end of the instruction? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Put him first, prioritize him, seek him, and he'll take care of the rest. You don't have to worry and fret about it. I want you to go to Isaiah 40. We did this last week. We looked at an Old Testament parallel to this passage. I want you to see that this week as, as well. And this passage of Scripture has, has spoken to me for many years. Isaiah 40. Isaiah is pretty easy to find. It's a big book. Go halfway to your Bible and then go a little bit to the right. And, and Isaiah will be right there. I think this speaks into the same idea of our big, strong, capable God who takes our worry and fears. Isaiah 40, if you, don't, if you don't have it, look on somebody next to you. Verse number 28. Rhetorical questions here, but hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? It says, don't you know? God is everlasting. Go back to where there, to the beginning of any of creation. Go there and you'll find a self-existent, eternal God still there. It's tough to wrap our minds around that, but God is from everlasting. He's Lord. He's Jehovah. He's creator. Look through a microscope and see all the intricacies of a cell and look through a telescope and see the grandiose of the cosmos and all of that he created, he designed, it's all by his hand. He fainteth not, neither is weary. God didn't get tired yesterday. God didn't wake up with a headache this morning. He's not sick, he's not stressed, he's not worried about what's happening in your life. He's not up in heaven saying, oh, they made a mess of it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I didn't see that one coming. That's, that's not God. He doesn't faint. He's not weary. I have three little kids right now, and these three little kids are little balls of human energy is what they are. 
they run around and, and they want to be crazy. And especially my four-year-old right now, he's getting in that like, I don't want to go to bed. Like, go to bed, please. He's, he's, he's just constantly going, 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 going. But even that little ball of energy, praise the Lord, he gets faint and weary at the end of the day, right? <laughs> All the parents can say a hallelujah to my kids, get tired, and they go to bed. And shortly thereafter, I get tired and I go to bed, but I'm glad they wear out. God doesn't wear out. He don't need a nap. He's not wringing his hands about what's going on in your life. That's not God. He's not faint. He's not weary. There's no searching of his understanding. We talked about this last week. You can hire the greatest investigative journalist you want in the world to try to write your report and investigate God and his wisdom and his understanding, but you're not going to get but one, one teeny, weenty little piece of it, and that's just from Scripture. To know his understanding. You know, I used this just a couple weeks ago on a Sunday night. You take, if you took all of time, reach back into eternity past and reach forward into eternity future and pull it as tight as you can and pull all that time into an hour. Is all of time. You are one fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. I could keep going for a long time of a second. Representing that hour, your life, vapor, gone, tiny. I'll be generous to you and I'll give you a second. That's really generous. One second. You watch a 60 minute TV show, watch the whole thing beginning to end. I come in in the middle of it and I watch one second of the TV show. Boop, it turns off. Who would I be to tell you what the TV show is about? Who would I be to say, I saw my one second. I don't really like the plot development there. It should have gone a different way. And I don't really like that character. It's bad casting. I don't. You saw the whole thing. I saw one second. I'm going to understand. I'm going to really know. I'm going to really get the big picture. No. God everlasting knows it all. We're going to tell him, God, you don't understand. God, my worry. God, this is too much. God, I can't handle this. God, I no, 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 no. There's no searching of his understanding. He tells us who we are in the next verse. Verse number 29. Actually, it's him. Still God. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So he who doesn't faint gives power to those who do faint. He who never gets weary gives strength to those who have no might. So whatever situation is facing you, whatever worries you, whatever perplexes you, know that it's only God who's strong enough to be able to change it. It's only God who's loving enough to want to if it's necessary. And it's only God who's wise enough to know how. He gives this, verse 30, this is us, even the youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall utterly fall. That's a vivid picture. If there's anyone who's strong and doesn't fall, it's the youth and the young men. I have been a teen camp counselor. I can attest to that verse. What happens at teen camp? You go five days without sleep because you got some senior high boys who are nutso. They like slept up for the whole week. They went to hibernation mode. You're already wore out come Monday. You go to teen camp with them and they're ready to run for four days straight without a, without a wink of sleep. Go all day, run, play, drink Mountain Dew, stay up all night and be crazy, and you're trying not to sleep. Run all the next day, drink more Red Bull, stay up all night. Run all the, you get by the end of it, and you're ready to die because these boys are wearing you out because they're, they're young men who can just go and go and go. But even they faint. Even they get tired. Even they fall. There's, there's a lot of anxiety medication that's being prescribed to our elementary, junior high, high school, and college age young people right now. Even they fall. But, verse 31, they that wait upon the Lord, those that, like a waitress at a table on a customer, those that, that look to, long for, want to serve, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The promise is given to those that wait upon them. Jesus says that your, your worry is attached to your lack of faith, so seek him first, and then all this will be added to you. Paul says you're worrying. Take your prayers 
turn them unto God. Give them to him with thanksgiving. Turn them over to him. You see it over and over and over again. You want, you want a key, you want a window into how to have victory, how to, how to overcome your anxiety and your worry and your fret and your consternation. It's not medicines, it's not essential oils, it's not beta blockers. I'm not against doctors, I'm not against therapists, I'm not against you taking a bubble bath or taking a vacation or getting some time away from kids or all the rest of it or reading a good book. Go ahead, knock yourself out. But if you do that and negate turning it over to God, you lost. That is how you get peace. That is biblically how a Christian gets peace that passes all, all understanding and guards your heart and your mind is by taking all that is pent up inside of you. The Bible is not against you expressing your emotions, but give them to him. Cry it out with him. Talk to him. Tell him what concerns you. Tell him your fears. Give him your anxiety and say, Lord, I get who you are. And I get how big and strong and powerful you are, so I'm putting it in your hands. And I'm seeking you. I want to say this in closing. I dare say, if you're not a Christian, and if you are a Christian, you understand this previously, probably our greatest fear and our greatest anxiety, though we don't think about all too often, but it's there lurking in the back of our mind all the time, is the fear of death. For most people, their greatest woe is if I allow my mind to engage and what will happen when I die? Will I go to heaven or not? Will I face eternal condemnation and judgment or not? If you're anything like me, my story is that I wanted to go to Jesus because I was real concerned about what would happen to me after I died as a middle schooler. I hope that you have a peace about that right now, but if you don't, let me talk to you for two minutes. The angels announced at Jesus' birth, peace on earth, goodwill to men. What were they saying when they announced peace to the earth? They were announcing that through the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of this man, that we could have peace with God that we could have what we sing about this morning. My sins are washed away. I'm amazed he loved me. I'm forgiven that I have peace with him, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. That it is possible, according to the Bible, to know that you have eternal life, to know that you have heaven, to not have to pillow your head at night and worry about if I don't wake up from my sleep, what will happen to me? To know that I have peace with God, right standing with him, I will be in heaven one day, and that is not attached to any of your good or any of your works or anything that you do on your own, none of it. It's 100% directly correlated to what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save people from their sins. He dies on a cross. He's buried and he raises from, a dead, from the dead to tell us that your sins are taken care of, they're squared away. I've raised from the dead to put my stamp of approval and validation that you can trust everything that I just did. And if you will come to him in repentance and faith and say, Jesus, I cannot save myself. I cannot solve my sin problem. I cannot forgive myself, but you can and you have made a way. So I humbly bow before you and tell you, Give to me what, what I cannot do for myself. I take the anxiety and the fear of my eternity and I roll it upon you and I trust that to your hands and your hands alone and I put my faith in you and you alone. Then and only then, you can know a peace that passes all understanding even in regards to that. And it's only if you've experienced that peace with God, that reconciliation to God, it's only then that Philippians 4 becomes applicable to you. That's really only for people that already know God and have peace with him. And if you've never done that, that's step one. Start there. I don't, I don't know your story. I don't know all of your testimonies. Maybe you've been in church a long time. Maybe you're here for the first time this morning and you've never done that. If, you, if you've never done that, please experience the peace that is there. If you're a Christian and you have done that, please stop communicating that your God's untrustworthy. 
He is trustworthy. And we can take all that ails us and roll it over to him and experience peace that passes all understanding in and through Christ Jesus. That's how, that's how it ends. It's only in and through Jesus that this happens.